Amen. All right, are you ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning? I'm going to be reading from a couple of different passages. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll have the words for you up on the screens. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. And then moving on to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Paul says, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Today I want to share with you about the day that our works are tested. The day that our works are tested. May the Lord give us his grace as we look into his word together. In your program this morning, there's a handout. You can use it to follow along if you like and take some notes. If you're worshiping with us online this morning, you can also download that handout from the chat as a PDF. Let's talk about the day our works are tested. So the year was 146 B.C., about two centuries before Paul wrote these letters to the church at Corinth. In 146 B.C., the city of Rome was already conquering territory and expanding to the east. Rome was waging war against a coalition of cities in Greece, and Corinth was the strongest of them. And the Romans taught Corinth a lesson it would never forget crushing the Corinthians in battle. And the Roman general was not merciful. After slaughtering the men of the city, he ordered Corinth to be burned to the ground. Only a few buildings of marble remained. The Romans then gathered up some valuable objects of silver and gold, and then Corinth lay in ruins for a century. The Corinthian Christians who received Paul's letters knew that story very well. And perhaps Paul had it in mind as he warned them of a different fire. Believers in Christ will one day face a fire that is much more thorough when our deeds and motives are inspected by the gaze of Jesus. The Apostle Paul saw Christ in a vision coming to judge the earth. He said, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Throughout the scriptures, the apostles and prophets proclaimed this same message, that Jesus is coming to judge the world in righteousness. That is a sobering truth, but I want you to know that for Christians, it is also an encouraging and glorious truth. This morning, let's look briefly into five important questions about the judgments of God and the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Five important questions. The first question is this, why will God judge the world anyway? Why will God judge the world anyway? You know that many recoil from the idea of God judging the world, but God must judge because he is holy. Unlike you and me, God cannot simply ignore evil. The prophet Habakkuk said, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. 
If God failed to punish sin, he would be unjust. And friends, this was the dilemma that Jesus solved. How can a holy God receive sinful men? The cross reveals the answer. Jesus, God's son, would bear the punishment for our sins. And because Jesus bore our sins, now God can freely forgive the sin of anyone who will claim the benefit of Jesus' sacrifice. God can receive us and still be just because he punished sin in the person of his son. In other words, thank God, Jesus is our substitute. I didn't expect wailing and gnashing of teeth <laughs> to accompany this message quite so early, but there we are. How many of you are glad that Jesus, though, is our substitute? Amen? But you see, friends, if anyone refuses to come to God by the way of the cross, the Bible says the wrath of God remains upon that person because his sin hasn't been dealt with. And so, tragically, God will have to judge that man's sin. Church, we can rejoice that evil will not triumph in the end, nor will evil go unpunished. Why does God judge? He judges because he is holy. A second question about the judgments of God is this. What is the judgment of God like? Well, first, God's judgment is certain. In Hebrews 10, we read this. We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and the Lord will judge his people. You see, modern man thinks that he's a law unto himself, but there is a creator and there is a lawgiver who made us and he has the right to hold us accountable. We are answerable to him. Second, the judgment of God is all-inclusive. Everyone will stand before God someday. Christians and Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and Jews. The atheists will be there, cured of their unbelief. Every soul will be summoned to that court, and the invites do not say RSVP, because attendance will be mandatory. All the saints and villains of history will see him. God says, we sang it this morning, God says every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Third, the judgment of God is just. Centuries ago, Abraham asked the question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer is yes. Yes, of course he will. Every verdict will be perfectly fair and perfectly impartial. No one will be able to claim that he or she was cheated by heaven's court. And fourth, the judgment of God is final. There will be no appeal from that court. After all, there is no higher court to run to. Now we know, don't we, that nowadays it is not unusual to hear people say, who are you to judge me? Only God can judge me. Well, sadly, they will finally get their wish. How much better for people to bow the knee to Jesus now and have him wash their sins away. Let's ask a third question, a more specific question. It's a more sobering question. What is the judgment of unbelievers like? What is the judgment of unbelievers like? The Apostle John saw this judgment, and he tells us about it in Revelation chapter 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the, heaven, uh, the earth and the heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. 
And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Church, the Bible says that Christ is coming to rule this earth for a thousand years. It will be a kingdom of perfect peace and justice. You've been praying for that, whether you know it or not. This is what Christians have been praying for for 2,000 years. Every time that we've prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when Jesus comes, his faithful saints will reign with him. Then after a thousand years of peace, the Father will then transition the world into an eternal state of blessed perfection. And as that future eternity is about to begin, God will summon the wicked dead to appear before his great white throne. Now forget what Hollywood ideas may have taught you about what it is to stand before God. Here's the thing. This isn't really a judgment to decide whether a person is saved. See, the judgment of an unbeliever will only confirm what is already known. It will only ratify what that man, what that woman had become in this life. The unbelievers of all the ages will be there. They will be judged according to what they've done. There won't be a trace of unfairness from the divine judge, but without the benefit of Jesus' blood, to plead on their behalf, they will be condemned. Church, what a fearful future awaits those who reject the Son of God. Listen, how much we need to pray for those who have yet to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. That is the judgment of the unbeliever. But question number four is this. What is the judgment of believers like? What is the judgment of believers like? Believers in Jesus will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We saw Paul saying in 2 Corinthians 5, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Thank God, friends, if you believe in Jesus, your judgment is not like the judgment of the unbeliever. The wicked can only expect God's wrath, but Christians will know God's mercy. Why? Because Jesus has already borne God's wrath for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know that's John 3, 16. It's the most famous verse in the Bible. But maybe there's somebody here this morning that needs to hear the one after, that needs to hear John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I have good news today, church. God isn't holding this judgment to decide whether you are saved. If you've given your life to Jesus, forgiveness has come, and the question of your salvation has already been resolved. Paul told us in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Is it okay if we hear the gospel this morning? Amen. Listen. Foolish stories about St. Peter quizzing people at the pearly gates or putting your life on a set of scales. If you would really consider it for a moment, those stories are really offensive to the Word of God. These fictional scenarios may give some people false hope that they can gain heaven by their own efforts. But the Bible says it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, thank God this is not a judgment really of the Christian worker. It is a judgment of the Christian's works. We saw it in 1 Corinthians 3. Paul says each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. 
and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself, he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Let me say something, friends. The judgment of believers isn't like the purgatory of the Roman Catholic Church. This fire does not purify the worker, but it tests his workmanship. We are already saved through Jesus' blood without centuries of additional suffering on your part. Those ideas rob Jesus' blood of its power, and people who teach them fail to understand the cross of Christ. Paul mentions no punishment in these verses, and for good reason. Our sins, yours and mine, were already punished when the Lamb of God carried them away. <laughs> Isaiah tells us, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned aside, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. The point of this fire is to test our works, to see what kind they are. And Christ will reward us for what we've done for him. So bearing all this in mind, let's spend our last few minutes here together exploring our final question about the judgments of God. What can I anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ? What can I anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ. Probably this is, if you haven't been taking notes until now, this will be a good time to take notes because there will be a quiz. <laughs> what can we anticipate on the day our works are tested? You don't need to speculate because the Bible tells us, first, anticipate that people will be exposed. Jesus will not only judge what's visible, but what lies within. Our secrets will be laid bare. What we really thought about things, what we really loved, what we really despised. God in his mercy has not let us read each other's minds. How many of you are glad about that? You're glad you can't read everybody's mind? No, but you're glad they can't read yours. The Bible says no man knows what lies inside the heart of a man. Oh, but God does. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom, to whom we must give account. Jesus said, Beware of hypocrisy, because there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nor hid that shall not be known. Friends, all of our pretense, all of our posturing, will be pointless on that day. You know, sometimes we can all be a little bit guarded, even to our closest friends, but before the gaze of Jesus, we are all an open book. Aren't you so glad, church, that our judge was first our Savior? The second thing to anticipate at the judgment seat of Christ is this. Anticipate that people will be examined. People will be examined. Not only will everything be exposed, it will also be examined and examined thoroughly. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. You know what that means? That means the times that we didn't measure up, and it also means the times that we did some little secret thing to bless somebody. Christ will review them all. See, Church Jesus wants us to know that everything we do is important. Somebody maybe didn't think too much about a shoebox that they were packing, right? But it had a lifelong impact. Everything that we do in his name, big and small, creates echoes and helps to shape the destinies of the people around us. In addition to our actions, okay, uh, this, this is your least favorite part coming up right here. In addition to our actions, Jesus says we will give account for every idle word that we speak. 
at the throne of Christ, your tongue and mine will be up for review. Everybody's least favorite part. He will also judge our motives. On earth, men are judged on what they do. But one day, Jesus will reveal why they did it. Jeremiah 17, God says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Church, let's be careful how we labor. Things we do for the sake of applause will create a foundation of straw that will not survive the gaze of Jesus. Remember how he said, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Our secret works and words and motives will all be examined by his eyes. All right, you can take a deep breath now. Exhale if you would like. Are you ready for some really good news? See, because if you don't give someone the good news, along with God's gracious warnings, then you really aren't giving them the full gospel because the gospel is good news. Sometimes we need to receive the warnings of God, but we need to hear the good news because God wants to encourage us, not crush us. What can you anticipate on the day that our works are tested? Anticipate that people will be exalted. Anticipate that people will be exalted. The Bible says that God is a faithful wage payer and his faithful ones will be rewarded. Some will receive notable positions of authority in his kingdom. We don't fully know how it's all going to work, but I am happy to leave that to the creativity of an almighty God. I see from 1 Corinthians 3 that he will reward us based on the quality of our work. I don't see any mention of the quantity of our works in that passage, but we already know from other places in the scripture that Jesus wants us to bear much fruit for him. So I would say, ideally, ideally we should bring to the feet of Jesus both quality and quantity. And the fire of his gaze will reveal, again, the kinds of works we've done. Paul says the fire will test each one's work. Will our works be gold or will they be only hay? Were they done out of love or were they done for man's acclaim? Were we diligent or half-hearted? Did we work out of joy or did we work out of obligation? Selfish works of stubble will be burned up. Paul says that such people will suffer loss, but they themselves will be saved. Remember, this is not a judgment to decide whether you are saved, but it's for Christ to reward you personally. Thank God, all of us who are believers in Jesus will be there. Perhaps after the inspection, our wardrobes will not be quite as splendid as we had anticipated that they were going to be. We might have deceived ourselves into thinking we were bringing Jesus a pile of diamonds when we were really only carrying straw, God forbid. But at least such people will be there through the mercies of God and experience the joy of the Lord. The Bible says, you know, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. We may be sitting in the bleachers. We may be sitting in the, I don't know how many balconies they have out there. There's probably a lot. We might be sitting in the 500th balcony, you know, in the nosebleed section of heaven. But we'll still be able to praise God forever because of his amazing grace. But listen, church, and this is, this is where we want to focus. It's so much better to work for Jesus now, today, while we have the opportunity and win an everlasting prize. In this world, don't we often struggle to gain things that are just empty? We labor to achieve things that will one day likely go up in smoke. And when we see Christ and the glories of heaven, so many of our current concerns will seem so trivial. But every day, every day, I want you to say that, every day, every day that you're still alive in this world 
is a gift-wrapped opportunity from heaven. It is a fresh opportunity to work for Christ so that one day you will hear his personal commendation. Do you know this is personal, right? You're not going to be up there some morning, 11 o'clock, an angel comes out with a clipboard. You know the type. All right, at 11 o'clock, everyone who went to harvest time, you're in. Come on, move it, people, move it, people. Doors swing out. One church comes out. Harvest time gets pushed in real quick, and Jesus says, you guys were great. Thank you. Praise God. No. Personal commendation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, everyone who competes in athletics is working for a perishable crown, but we are working for one that never fades. And God assures us that those works that aren't consumed by fire will be richly rewarded. The Bible says there will be degrees of rewards for faithful believers. We don't understand all that yet, but everyone's reward will be personal, will be uniquely his own, uniquely her own. Some people's rewards will be more glorious than others. You know, Jesus spoke about one man ruling over five cities and another ruling ten. Some might say, well, Pastor Nick, that was a parable, though. Well, we do know that when the Lord returns, the Bible says the saints will reign with him. The Apostle John tells us in Revelation, they will be priests of God and Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Church, surely God will know how to reward you, reward us with authority in his kingdom, even if it's mysterious to us right now. So don't fret over that. Hey, just think, without even realizing it, you came in here this morning, and you might be sitting next to the future king of the Bronx. Not only will there be special grants of authority, there will also be special crowns that you can win from the hand of Jesus. Paul told Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, listen, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all, to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love righteousness? Do you long for his appearing? If so, then Jesus may give you that crown too. There are other kinds of crowns as well, the Bible talks about. And each one of them will testify something. It will say something about your victorious life here on earth. Your crown might be a great conversation starter someday. Could you imagine that? Hey, how'd you get that crown? Pfft, you don't want to know. <laughs> the Bible talks about the crowns that Jesus wears and also the crowns that we believers wear. Jesus wears the kingly crown. In Greek, it's the diadema. It is the diadem crown. That's where we get that word diadem from. And that is a band of gold across the forehead. It's not the big heavy crown, you know, like the king of England would wear that we're familiar with. It doesn't look like that. Revelation says that Jesus is crowned with many of these crowns. And when he comes, only Jesus will wear the diadem. Only Jesus will wear the kingly crown, praise God. The crowns that you and I will receive are different. The crown that we wear is the victor's crown, the conqueror's crown. In Greek, it's, the word is Stephanos, and that's what has given us the name Stephen. So any Stephens in the house this morning, you are named after this crown. It was a wreath of leaves woven together that was placed upon the head. And the Greeks used to give this crown to Olympic champions. So back then, you didn't get a gold medal when you won. You got a crown of olive leaves, and then they also gave you a pot of olive oil. But, you know, maybe Paul is reminding us how we overcome through that oil, through the strength of the Holy Spirit. So maybe what we said earlier makes more sense now. Paul said that athletes compete for a perishable crown, but we compete for an imperishable crown. 
See, in ancient Greece, when you won in the Olympics, your crown would fade. But in heaven, you will have an eternal crown to lay at Jesus' feet and say, Lord, I made it because of your grace. Yeah. Worship team, you can come back, please, and help us. Friends, as we close, hear this. We'll receive a victor's crown because one day Jesus took off his kingly crown. One day Jesus did wear a crown that men had woven and it was a crown of thorns. That was a Stephanos crown. It was a victor's crown. And because Jesus overcame and wore a victor's crown for you, you can also. Besides the crown of righteousness that Paul mentioned, there's a crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. How many of you like to bring people to Jesus? Jesus will award you that crown. There's a crown of life for those who endure temptation and persecution. There's a crown of glory for all of those who faithfully feed the flock of his people. Church, there's a glorious crown to be won. The Bible also speaks of special rewards for overcomers, for those who prevail over sin, over circumstances, and over everything that hell can throw at them, for people who are not ashamed of Jesus. Jesus says, if you overcome, listen, one of the most amazing promises in all of God's word, if you overcome, he will give you the power, the authority, the right to sit with him in his throne just the same way that he overcame and sat down with his father in his father's throne. Wow. You ought to spend some time reading the book of Revelation, not because it makes a cool action movie, but so that you can see how Jesus is encouraging you to hold on and receive a great reward from him. Church, it's time to work for Jesus like never before. Work for him today. Work for him now. Before it's too late. Before it's too late to win any more fruit on this earth. You're not going to have the chance to earn any more fruit or crowns in heaven. Work for Jesus now before it's time for that last inspection. I know none of us is perfect. We all know that. Some of what we have done will probably prove in his presence to be wood and hay. But he is a faithful God, and he encourages us to work for him because everything that we do for him, everything we do in his name will be amply rewarded. Jesus won't forget any of your labors, any of your sacrifices. He won't forget your prayers, your giving, your tears, your troubles. There's a cloud of witnesses pulling for you to make it, pulling for you to overcome when you face temptation. Jesus himself is cheering you on, saying, be faithful to me and I will give you a crown of life. So we need to commit our hearts completely to him today. Decide, decide, decide that whatever time, whatever energy you have left on this planet belongs to him and that you will give your heart and soul and if necessary, your body as well to serve him. If we truly live for him, the Bible promises us, read it in the book of Jude, that Jesus will present you to his father faultless with exceeding joy. On the day that our works are tested, let your works be gold and silver and precious stones and you'll experience joy in the Father's presence. All of your trials will have been worth it when you hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on, let's stand together and give Jesus the King some praise. Come on, give him a great praise. He's worthy of it.